My life has been a journey from an artist to a designer, and I could take every word from each one of the talks so far and weave them into my own story because each one of the speakers had an element of truth that I share with them. I think most fundamentally is the humor of the story, the change of circumstances of the story, the identity of the story, the issue of normalcy, what we think is normal for human beings and how we judge people in the Western world most likely, based on what we conceive as normal. And lastly, on the issue of the artist versus the designer. Having been an artist most of my life as a filmmaker, videographer, fine artist, performance artist, turned designer, it didn't come easy because design is a very different discipline than art. Design is all about problem solving. Art is about expression, adventure, subjectivity, me. Design is about you, your problems, how to solve them. My goal in life is to try to do my best to help change the way we think about life and death and human enhancement. The scope of this is transhumanism. Now I know that transhumanism has a history that is questionable based on a lot of false advertising, misconceptions, lack of understanding about what a transhuman is and what a posthuman is, what a cyborg is, but what is human in the first place? If I could at least change a little bit about the way you think about life and death, then I feel that it would have done something marvelous. And when we think about human enhancement, are we all not enhancing ourselves every moment with information, with knowledge through our devices? I had an idea about a possible future human body as a designer, not an artist. And I'm going to tell you a story that I've never told before, and I'm a little bit nervous about it because it's only been told in one magazine, which we'll close with. But I had an experience while traveling the world. I was at the height of my career, enjoying life, thinking about all the possibilities about performing, video, film. I was filmmaker in Telluride, Colorado. I was the artist of the Los Angeles Film Festival. I was performing in Telluride, Colorado, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, on my way to Switzerland, to Zurich, and finally the Paris Film Festival um, as an artist. I stopped off in Japan to make a little money, performing every night, and something happened there which turned me from being the subjective artist with a mode of expression to thinking about problems as they arise. I was found unconscious and hemorrhaging in a dark, damp hallway on the floor of a Japanese restaurant. I don't remember much. I do remember the ambulance and the blood, and I do remember the operating room, and I remember the surgeon looking over me with an English-Japanese dictionary saying, you may not live. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I suffered an ectopic pregnancy. I survived after two weeks in intensive care, but it changed my life forever because I felt enormous anguish. How could I be so foolish? Why didn't I know that I was pregnant? Why didn't I realize that I was carrying a child? The fetus died, and I almost died with it, but fortunately I lived, and I was so thankful for that. I remember in the hospital teaching myself how to walk again. And I remember thinking, if I ever get out of here, out of Japan, I'm going to do something marvelous, something outside the realms of what I'd done before. I took a look at myself, and I took a look at the arts, and I decided that I was no longer an artist. That all the films in Hollywood that I'd worked on at 20th Century Fox or Zoetrope, with many of my friends who were world famous directors, they weren't interested in the human story as far as life and death. They were interested in maybe their story of their human death or their human life, but not the species of humanity. And not from the perspective of technology, what we have, where we're going, and what could be possible. 
I took a look inside my own body, had numerous uh, scans, uh, looked inside my own brain. And I thought, why on earth are we not backing up our brain on a moment-to-moment -moment basis? We're so fragile. We're so vulnerable. Any moment, any one of us could have something going on in our bodies that we don't know about. Since that time, I've had cancer twice. I have artificial lenses on my eyes. And I've gone through other types of situations that have been on the edge, but not as tragic as Japan. That was a turning point for me. And since then, I've joined many groups like Quantified Self. I'm sure you have Quantified Self here in uh, Munich, as well as Berlin and other uh, towns in Germany. It's where an individual can go and share, much like with TEDx and TED, to talk about how technology affects their lives, how we can be more responsible, self-responsibility about our lives, to know what's going on in our bodies, and that's coming to fruition today. When I uh, got back to Los Angeles, where I was living, I tried to make some changes. On my way to being a designer, but not quite there yet, I was still curious about what I could possibly do. I started a TV show called Trans Century, Transhuman Update, aired in Los Angeles, 100,000 people watched it, as well as in Telluride, Colorado, a large population, and Aspen, Colorado. I also did other projects. I wrote the Transhuman Manifesto about living life and appreciating life and sustaining life. That was a, went on board the Cassini-Huggins spacecraft. I also ran for the Green Party and was elected by a landslide in Los Angeles County, Malibu, Santa Monica, down to Redondo Beach, on a platform that technology can solve the problems that we're facing with overpopulation, with lack of food and energy for many places around the world. I spoke to Buckminster Fuller, who designed the geodesic dome, and he encouraged me to proceed ahead. And we talked about the issue of design, and this is what changed my work from artist to designer. Buckminster Fuller said, there is enough for everyone, it's just a matter of distribution. There is bureaucracy and uh, big businesses, uh, tyranny, hegemony, anything you want to call it that stands in the way from production to getting to people who need supplies and care, love and nurturement, homes. But that wasn't enough for me. That was just a matter of being written up in Wired magazine or LA. Um, on the cover of LA Weekly. Too many magazines, too much stuff, not enough passion on my part. So I went away by myself for a while, and then it hit me. I could be a designer, but I needed something worth talking about, worth doing, and I needed a passion. I didn't have it. I had a passion to live. I had a passion to talk about technology. I had a passion to try to talk about and find out why we are so vulnerable in our bodies, why we talk about the Green Party or energy, overpopulation, but we don't care enough about our own species, our own family, our children, our parents, our loved ones, and the fragility and vulnerability of their daily lives, that anything could happen at any moment. And then it hit me. I would design a future body. That was in 1996. My surgery was in 1980. So from Los Angeles, those 20 years, I said thinking and thinking and thinking of what could I do, what could I do? I felt I had lost my ambition and my purpose as an artist until, again, after talking with Buckminster Fuller and thinking about what am I really interested in? It's a whole body. A one that is more perceptive, more aware, more durable, more flexible, more sustainable than the body we have. And mind you, I love my body. I'm an athlete. I hope to live a very long time, but it's not good enough. And it's becoming better only because of certain elements like cognitive and neuroscience, nanotechnology for nanomedicine, information technology like artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence, biotechnology like stem cell cloning, uh, nanotech for nanorobots, um, cryobiology for embryos and sperm freezing, and now we have able to freeze women's eggs, but we weren't able to before I lost my baby. So the world has changed within that 20 years that I went through my transition in trying to understand what I could do that was meaningful in my life, besides <laughs> make films about myself. So cryonics is one solution, but it's not the only solution. 
What we have today is a series of possibilities for a new human body. It's not to replace this body necessarily, but if you want a different body, what would the future be like, say 2050, 2045, 2050, 2060? Now let me explain this a little bit so you don't get too upset about it. The human body is a marvelous biological mechanism. It works beautifully. We see enormous attributes of our athletes, especially at the Olympics. The musicians, the vocalist who is just speaking before me, exquisite voice. The beauty of humanity is something we're aware of, but it's not enough. Now Nietzsche said that we should become superhuman. Well, maybe. Maybe there's something to that. Finot, Jean Finot said we should live longer. Maybe there's something to that. And Fedorov, Nikolai Fedorov in Russia said, we must resurrect our life. There's something to be said about that. We're already doing it. If we can freeze an embryo and bring it back and implant it in a woman, that's something pretty amazing. If we can change genders from a male to a female, that's something pretty amazing. The fact that we can reverse aging at certain times in our lives is pretty amazing. And the issue about backing up our brain is currently occurring at Stanford University, MIT, Hartford, uh, not to mention many universities around the world. Cognitive science and neuroscience, together with robotics, artificial general intelligence, will forever change our bodies. So this is in 1996. I came up with the first future human prototype. I didn't do it alone. I learned from having talked to Buckminster Fuller that I needed a team of very smart people who were actually much smarter than myself. I enlisted them. <clears throat> Marvin Minsky, father of artificial intelligence. Eric Drexler, father of nanotechnology. Ben Gertzwill and Peter Voss, the founders of artificial general intelligence. Uh, Greg Fay, the world's leading cryobiologist. Uh, let's see who else. Uh, philosopher Max Moore, my husband, who wrote the philosophy of transhumanism. These individuals saw beyond the limitations of their fields. Now, certainly they were uh, precursors and purveyors of their time, to be sure, but they had an idea. Eric Drexler, in talking about nanotechnology in his book, Engines of Creation, which was his uh, PhD at MIT, set the wave for nanotechnology, molecular manufacturing, and today what do we have? 3D printing. And what are we talking about? 3D printing, printing human bodies. Okay, now let's look at um, Howard Cohen. Oh, the speaker before me just spoke of him. I've known Harold for many, many years. Harold created the first robot that started painting at um, the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco many years ago. I think it was 1972. Yeah, I think 1972, no, 1979, I saw it. His robot was going around the room painting on canvas. Now, this was something interesting at that time. This is before Raymond Kurzweil came up with the idea of the artificial lens and, and giving sight to the blind, long before the idea of the singularity. But these ideas all formed together robotics, AGI, nanomedicine, um, uh, whole body prosthetics. Now, let's take prosthetics, for example. This would be a whole body prosthetic driven by nanotechnology, artificial general intelligence, and robotics and a few other technologies yet to be seen. What's its purpose? Its purpose is to give someone a body, another body, if their body no longer functions. Why would you use this? Okay, let's look at world's leading scientist, Stephen Hawking's uh, ALS, a very uh, dreadful disease. Uh, many people die of it. Stephen Hawking has been able to live a very long time with ALS, but his body doesn't function. He's a brilliant mind, and the only way he can communicate is through a tap of a finger, um, to a generated um, computerized voice. Last night on TV, in my hotel room, I was watching a show on BBC News, I think it was, about nanotechnology and prosthetics. Today, we're able to give prosthetic robotic limbs to an individual who is uh, paralyzed from C4 down. That is amazing. So someone in a wheelchair, in a chair, can get up and start walking with a robotic um, exoskeleton. These are just small, small beginnings of the issue of human enhancement. Now, human enhancement is a field that incorporates humans, transhuman, posthuman. Okay, let's say the human is a biological agency. 
We have a biological body. Yes, we have glasses, and maybe we have uh, hearing aids or um, false teeth or some type of enhancement. But we don't consider that changing what we esteem to be normalcy or normal for the human. It fits within that parameter of what is normal. However, if we go outside that, then that's something else. So the transhuman is when we start looking at semi-biological, when we have robots put in our body to repair cell damage. Uh, nanomedicine is the uh, field there. So with nanomedicine, you would have small robots going inside the body and repairing types of uh, cell damage. If I had had nanomedicine back when I was pregnant, it would have gone in, found my fetus growing outside my womb, and put it back in my womb, saving its life and causing me less grief, but then I wouldn't be here today. So things happen, and we deal with the consequences of our lives, and we do our best to try to resolve, to go anew and afresh, to change our lives, to give it more purpose, more understanding, more meaning. For me, it was the whole body prosthetic, but that's just the beginning. Now, after I designed the whole body prosthetic, wow, did I hit a lot of constraint. President Bush's bioethics council trashed me. It was pretty embarrassing when <laughs> we talk about going through the stories. It was horrible. Transhumanism, they said, is the world's most dangerous idea. Now, mind you, I had written the Transhuman Manifesto in 1983, and here it was around, two th I was on the cover of Wired magazine with Jean Calmeille, who was the longest living woman, uh, 2000. So this is, let's say, 2003, four. And transhumanism had lifted off my body design. Uh, the primo post human had hit newspapers and magazines around the world. I wasn't a big name. No one knew who I was, but they knew what my future body design was. And it got trashed after it got applauded and sh flashed around the world. So how did I deal with this? I tried my best. I was invited to the World Trade Center <laughs> in Boston to speak about future bodies. Um, that didn't go over very well. Um, some journalists would say that she doesn't like her body. She wants to be perfect. She doesn't want to age. Well, that's not true. I love my body. I love my age. I'm in my mid-60s. That's perfectly fine with me. Um, I'm athletic. I enjoy everything. I hope to live a long time. That's not the thing. The thing is, when you go through a life and death situation, and you're so fortunate to survive it, many of us want to do something to give back, to find a new way of looking at the world. Well, I do a lot of volunteer work, but that wasn't enough. I wanted to do something that would be something new and fresh as an artist designer. When you fly too high like Icarus, you're often damned. You're often wanted to be pulled down because you're going outside what is considered norm or normalcy for humans. We're not supposed to fly too high, push too hard, go too far. In fact, we're supposed to be alive within the sphere of what we call the biosphere. And we go out into cyberspace, the metaverse, second life, et cetera, and we take on multiple identities. That was questionable at first. When the first embryo was born, that was questionable at first. Was she really a human? The first person who had a prosthetic part didn't look too satisfactory. I remember one of my elementary school teachers had a plastic arm that just stood like this. Today, um, you can have a prosthetic arm that is not only roboticized, it has artificial intelligence in it, and it also works with your neurological makeup. So the neurons firing in your brain, performing synapses, can trigger information to your hand so you can feel the heat of a cup. When you handshake, you can feel the hand, the warmth of someone else's hand. This is marvelous. And when you think of the number of people who need prosthetic parts, the fact that they're getting better and better is so fantastic for these people. The fact that someone can get up out of a wheelchair and walk, wow, I mean, it just brings tears to your eyes to think about that. Especially individuals who've gone to war and had their, their limbs blown off, that they may have a life afterwards, to me, is absolutely phenomenal. So, the issue here is that we can change our circumstances, that we can look at the world afresh and anew and think about life extension as a possibility, that death is not the final answer. We can eventually push our lifespans a little bit longer, live in multiple environments, live in near-Earth orbitat, um, habitat. We don't have to worry about overpopulation. The population in the world is going down. There will be resolve for this if we think like Buckminster Fuller, that there are solutions, that those of us who want to live longer and enhance should have an opportunity, and those who do not 
ought never to ever be coerced to live outside what they think is normal for them. Thank you.